Camera's live in three, two, one. Hello. Well, <laughs> looks like we've uh, got some participants. Looks like we're live. Uh, hello, where, wherever you are. The beauty of uh, modern technology is we're joining you from various places around the uh, world. And I'm assuming that uh, you, those who are tuning in are also scattered around the world. I, I, I like that. Uh, my name is John Bowermaster. I'm a writer and a filmmaker. I have a long relationship with National Geographic Society here in the United States. I'm, I'm this morning in, in New York where it's quite early. Um, and I have a particular fondness for ocean and ocean issues, although I've written about and, and made films about every imaginable environmental issue in, in, the, in, the, in the world, really. Um, I did a big project for 10 years at the Geographic where we took the, the, the kind of shtick was we took kayaks around the world, one continent at a time, looking at kind of an emblematic coastline to talk about environmental issues on that particular continent. So that was seven trips plus Oceana. And it was up to me to find the, the funding, the idea, the, the teams, et cetera. And when it came to Australia, I, was, I, was, I have to say I was very intimidated uh, because it's so big. You know, and I'm looking for an emblematic coastline in Australia. It's so huge. I ran my finger around it, you know, a thousand times. Couldn't couldn't find the right place. So we settled on Tasmania instead. We we circumnavigated, almost circumnavigated uh, Tasmania, and then end, ended up in, in uh, uh, Flint on Flinders Island with the mutton birds, which was great. So my Australia experience is limited to to to. Tasmania, but number two on the list was the Kimberley, which is the, the Western region that we're gonna talk about today um, because of that big, beautiful river, the Fitzroy and, and because of the indigenous history there. Um, unfortunately, I have not made it there yet, but uh, soon. Um, and maybe before we start a conversation about uh, the indigenous science and, and the Fitzroy and the Kimberley, et cetera, maybe I'll, maybe I'll let Anne Paulina and, and Nick Rothel introduce themselves and then we'll, uh, We'll go from there. But thanks for joining us. Stay tuned. We're gonna we're gonna show a couple trailers. One uh, from Nick's films, one early on, and one towards the end. If you have questions, please add them to the chat. Uh, we'll we'll get to those towards the end. Um, but maybe Anne, would you like to go first? Great. Look, mabo bayan ngayo nilwala and Paulina ngayo imaro raman and ngay mandejara nige na ngay nige na nganga jaida boro nige na. So I'm just saying hello, my name is Anne Polina and I'm just welcoming you, saying good evening, everybody. Um, and also that I'm a woman who belongs to the Fitzroy River, which is behind me. So um, in terms of a little bit about me, um, this is not a job, this is my destiny. <laughs> so I'm born into this role. And um, my background is I'm a biophysical and social scientist. Um, my real claim to fame is I'm trying very, very hard to be a good and decent human being. So from that perspective, um, the old people keep me grounded. They tell me sit on the ground because you've got nowhere else to fall. So it's a beautiful um, environment. It's an amazing place. It's globally unique. It really is um, somewhere that everybody should put on their, hopefully not bucket list, but come and see it, come and feel it, come and be a part of it. And I hope this conversation tonight with Nick and John is going to just give you a little bit of a touch of how to feel and hear this country. Thank you. Nick, you're, you're up. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks to everyone that's tuning in. It's a real honor and pleasure to share my film with you. Undermine Tales from the Kimberley that we made uh, between 2016 and 2018 in the Kimberley region with a lot of help from Anne and other people there. We worked closely with Albert who's in the film and uh, other peak bodies from indigenous bodies there like Kalak. Uh, I just, my, my background is I'm a filmmaker. I'm a documentary filmmaker. I've always been a filmmaker and you know, that's I'm right now calling you from Rome where I'm working on a project, but I'm Australian and currently based in London. Uh, I just want to talk briefly to what John was saying about the coast of the Kimberley. And one of the things I discovered up there was how untouched the Kimberley coast is. You know, it's over a thousand miles of untouched coast. You can go down that coast 
lying in a boat and not even see a, a light on the shore. So, you know, this is another reason why the area needs to be protected. It's one of the most unspoiled areas on the planet. And going there and spending time with the land and with the people there was a life changing experience for me. Working up there grounded me and helped me understand uh, Australia, which is my home, in a, in a way that I never did. It's a quintessentially unchanged, unspoiled part of Australia that needs to be protected. So, Thank you and welcome everyone. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. I look forward to, I've seen the trailer, but I haven't seen the whole film yet. So after the fact. Uh, and I wanted to also mention that we were to be joined by Albert Wigan, who is a ranger in the Kimberley and is in Nick's film and is a friend of Anne's, but unfortunately is not able to join us at last minute. Uh, he's a ranger in, in, the, in the Kimberley and probably got some last minute call. And unless he just pops up mysteriously in the midst of the conversation, we'll, We'll catch him next time. Um, but you know, the, we, we want to talk a lot about the indigenous leadership and indigenous future in, in the Kimberley. We want to talk about the, the, the influence of ex, ex, explore, exploration for oil and gas and minerals, et cetera, which is, you know, wreaks havoc no matter where it arrives. We want to talk about the impact of all that on science and indigenous science in the Kimberley. Um, I guess if I'm going to start the conversation, and, and please, you guys, Anne and Nick, jump in if you if you have anything you want, to, any direction you want us to, to head. But I'm, I guess I'm, I'm kind of curious. My first question is, um, you know, how do you, Anne, since you're, you're a native, since you live there, how do you define the Kimberley? How do you, how do you describe it to, to others who have not been there? Yeah, it's a very good question. I think one of the things is it, it's globally unique and diverse. I mean, there's not another river system like this, let alone the marine system. And then you've got such diversity with the ranges, with the desert, with the sea, with the river. So there's a, it's, it's an amazing greenfield area that is so biodiverse. Not only that, the cultural diversity here is not found anywhere else on the planet in terms of intensity. What we're talking about is a system in the Kimberley, which is 96,000 square kilometres, which is in, ev evokes all of these things. And, you know, saltwater, freshwater interface is really, really critical. The fact that we have a beautiful species of fish that starts off in the river and grows to seven metres out to sea, like, hello, you know what I mean? Like, this is somewhere really, really special. And when you look at the EPS and IUCN reports, they're saying these last bastions of biodiversity, we need to sustain them. We need to maintain them. Our humanity is dependent on these ecosystems being healthy under the guardianship of indigenous people. So it is a very, very beautiful place. I mean, second highest tides in the world, um, the largest macro tidal delta in the world. Like you just keep going on and on and on and you think, hey, how come the world doesn't know about this place? I mean, Brian Cox came here some time ago because he was mapping the Indian Oceans and connecting all of the continents. And he just, he said, wow, this place is really special. So, you know, it is here, it belongs to the world because we see ourselves as global citizens. So what we're saying is that these are global assets under threat right now, and the world needs to stand with us in terms of how we protect them for current and future generations. Beautiful. Can I just jump in and add that, you know, going there from an outsider's point of view, you know, it's a it's an area to give people an idea the size of Germany with very few one sealed road going through the area and then lots of dirt roads and dirt tracks. And so it is protected in, by its size and by the, the fact that it's so remote and its lack of infrastructure but that's what's happening now it's the only undammed major river in australia and the, the threat coming from outside with big development of industry is putting in big infrastructure like new roads and opening up the country and you know that's i think people on the ground there like Anne and other people like albert and other people working there local indigenous people are doing a fantastic job and have been for a long time in protecting the country and standing up to the authorities and activists um, taking on the big businesses and the big companies and facing them down and, and holding them to account, basically. Um, you know, the population up there is small. The country is vast. The indigenous population is more than 50% of the population. And so it's, it's a remote place that, you know, people in the cities in Australia don't really know and connect with them. They need to get out and understand it. And 
and the power bases in Perth and in Canberra and the capital cities, uh, you know, they kind of dictate or they try and dictate what happens in, in other places in Australia, in places they don't understand. And that's one of the problems I think that people are facing up there. How, how many miles or how many kilometers long is the Fitzroy? 733. 733 kilometers? Kilometers, yeah. Kilometers, okay. I'm, I'm surprised to hear Nick say that it's undammed, which is for such a long river, it's, it's impressive. How, how, is it, how is it, I have to assume there have been threats of dam and hydropower over the years. How has it evaded that? Well, there's a threat. There has been a constant threat on the Margaret, I think, to dam it, which is one of the tributaries. And it's just been held off. You know, there's a huge dam in the north of the Kimberley region, um, a different region called the Ord River. And there's a, a dam, I think, 25 times the size of Sydney Harbour or something that feeds a huge agricultural area that's developed and is a bit of a white elephant really because it's never uh, been made sustainable and it's not really making money and now they're growing things like tea tree there and you know they've tried every kind of crop and and failed because of the conditions um, I'll let Anne talk more about the river but the river swells to I don't know how many kilometers wide in the wet season and and runs at a trickle or even just ends in billabongs in the dry season so you know, it's it's a unique landscape, and there's there have been constant threats to dam it, but as to this point, that's been avoided. And then maybe Anne wants to talk more about the pastoralists wanting to take a lot more water out of the river and things like that that are are constantly um, being negotiated in the region. And and is it the longest river in Australia? Uh, I think the Murray Darling might be the longest. The Dar I think the Darling might be lo yeah, the longest. And, um, now that we bring that up, there's a lot of issues with the Murray Darling. It ran dry due to over due to too much water being taken out of it by people upstream, especially licenses, water licenses, corrupt licenses being given out to all kinds of big agriculture like cotton growing. And uh, some of the companies and the owners of those properties along the Murray Darling that are lobbying government from bigger water licenses also have bought property along the Fitzroy and are lobbying the government to do similar things along there. And so that's one of the challenges that people face in taking them on. Mm -hmm. And what, what are, if you, if you can summarize, I know it, you could probably speak for, for hours on this question, but what, what are the biggest environmental threats to the region today? Uh, I think firstly, going back to it's all in the framing. At the moment, we do have a weir across um, one section of the Fitzroy River, but the conversation now is this is the place where they're coming for the new water trading water market. So what I'm saying is that call it what, what, what you want to call it, but um, we know that what you're talking about is water extraction. So exactly right in terms of what Nick's talking about, one of the biggest things that's killed the Murray-Darling River system has been the ext um, extraction through floodplain harvesting because they're creating uh, man-made dams on the land, which some of them are going 12, 13 kilometres long and they're, you know, diverting the water off there. So we have to be very careful about the framing. So we've been told by government that they're not looking to build a dam, but there's very clear indications that they will be looking to take water, harvest water from um, the, the floodplain system. So you know, uh, I think we need to be careful about that. I think one of the big issues at the moment um, is that there's no uh, plan from government in terms of what their intentions are doing. How do we set up some sort of statutory authority so that we can come into this space and look at how do we plan this sort of thing? Because at the moment, one of the big things is that we we're told there's going to be water trading, but on the other hand, we're also told, told that we're going to frack this Canning Basin, which is really the biggest thing that I'm worried about because if we are to frack a basin that's 500,000 square kilometres onshore and 100,000 off, it is highly likely that we will create the largest man-made destruction on the planet. This will be bigger than the Tar Sands project in Canada. So this is the level of devastation that's awaiting the planning process. And what we're saying is that we don't believe in terms of climate justice and the right to be able to live on a clean and healthy planet that we should be continuing looking at these big, large extraction projects, including extraction of water, but the destruction of this system, which will just be a whole nightmare. So there's no coordinated effort in terms of, let's look at the cumulative impacts of what government is planning. What is business planning to do 
razoring quite vast areas of wilderness or you know the savannah system which are carbon sinks just doesn't make sense to me and then to feed it genetic feed the cattle genetically modified cotton when we're talking about trying to get premium beef some of the modeling doesn't add up so what i'm saying is that we're really concerned about the fracking that's proposed here and why we as a nation are still pursuing unjust invasive colonial uh, extractive industries when we should be investing in making a just energy transition you know one of the big challenges we have across the world is how do we create peace with indigenous people and with nature we've lived with the anthropocene we've shaped the anthropocene all the way through and now we're in a situation where we've been the least contributors to the climate chaos that we see yet we hold the solutions for planetary well-being so what i'm saying is that it's time to have a conversation why is our nation state till still investing in you know um, fossil fuel extraction when we have an amazing nation that could be leading in renewable so some of the uh, conversations don't add up we need to be able to sit around the table and going okay what is government's intention what is industry's intention what is our intention because we told that where our lives are going to be traded off for somebody else from somewhere else to profit for such a short time when all we're doing is continuing the global unjust invasive colonial extractive industry when there's so much here we could be doing in terms of new economies so i'm saying to business we want to get into business there is opportunity for business biosphere reserves geoparks you know all of these sorts of things like this is where the world needs to go as this type of wilderness biodiverse area becomes more and more a, a rare around the world it's going to be a premium so what we're saying is that we want to come to the table and look at the new economies we seriously worry and care about people working in energy. How do we get our governments to make that just energy transition upscale, up to all people and start to look at how we move across? So we're still doing the old business the old way. And I think there's real opportunities to start, start to look at how do we do business differently, one with indigenous people, but with the resources that we need to plan carefully so we don't keep spiraling into climate chaos and we can have a climate chance. For the big extraction companies, they're, are they particularly interested to the region because is there a lot of shale beneath that, beneath the land and the and off the shoreline? Is that why they're after the the gas? Yes. Off the shoreline, the yeah. uh, gas extraction at sea. Now you know in the film you'll in in my film Undermind you'll see the story of uh, James Price Point, which was a gas hub that was supposed to press, process offshore gas the size of Dubai's hub that was gonna be built on the Kimberley coast. That was stopped due to the people on the ground there, activists a few years back. Um, now they're doing um, offshore extraction of, of liquefied gas from floating um, platforms. And they've got um, you know aircraft carrier size uh, processing plants, new technology that can process offshore and load the ships of, offshore. So they didn't have to build the plant onshore in the end, which is, which is a great thing. But there's also the, some of the largest deposits of iron ore in the world are in this region. Um, you know, just south of the Kimberley and the Pilbara are some of the biggest mining tracts in Australia. And a lot of the companies are looking over the border there to, to want to expand into the Kimberley, as are international companies like Mitsubishi, uh, Rio, all the big companies are there. Um, there's, there's, there's a big, um, as Anne mentioned, a big push to open up fracking. There's already a couple of uh, small fracking situations going on for testing and things in the Kimberley, but they're, they are cutting down um, bush right now to, to expand that. There's fracking, new fracking leases that overlap indigenous leases and cattle leases that have been bought up and sold off by government. Um, so the fracking thing is, is a really, uh, imminent threat, um, but there's all other kinds of precious minerals uh, um, as well, including uranium. Uh, there is a uranium mine already in the Kimberley and there's, um, there's potentially that could, there's also the biggest, some of the biggest diamond mines in the world that, I mean, it's a very rich area in terms of what's under the ground. And so the threats are coming from all sides. Well, we've made uh, several films Three or, three or four films here in the United States looking at fracking. So it's an mm. issue we know quite well. I, I live in New York State where they've actually been successful at banning fracking, despite the fact that we have a, a sizable shale deposit 
the Marcello shale beneath the, the land here. So we, we, we've had, we, the, the reason I bring that up is you can, you can win these things, you can be victorious, um, but it's a big fight. And we keep thinking that uh, the demand for natural gas and oil will decline, um, but instead it kind of levels off and then ramps up again. And, but, and, and, and Nick, you talked about uh, international companies coming in. Is, is the pressure mostly from uh, Australian companies or is it, is it outsiders or, or equally both? Uh, I'd say it's probably both. I mean, they're big multinational companies, but there's also Australian companies that are on the ground that uh, have been doing mining in the region for a long time. It's definitely both. And, but it's also the Australian government, you know, while we were making the film, we went to, to Darwin to a big conference about opening up the North, which was the whole theme of this conference that the government was hosting, uh, bringing in international uh, business people to talk about building new infrastructure in the North and opening up the North. And, and, you know, there were a couple of people we were working with uh, from the Kimberley, from indigenous leaders there to speak out against it. But, you know, it was really a conversation with government and business about how the government will support your proposals with infrastructure and tax breaks and everything else to help open up Northern Australia for the extraction of everything for everything. wealth. Yeah. And, and the scene behind you is the Fitzroy, is the Kimberley. It looks like a place ripe for uh, solar. Do you see uh, in initiatives for, for alternative energies growing or, or not? Yeah, I think it's uh, what's been really interesting is the private investment that's going and happening in this country um, and how, you know, the people are going, oh, we just need to be brave. You know, like a lot of people are saying we're in the energy game. We're not necessarily in fossil fuel. So, you know, there is serious opportunity for business. We're so close to Asia. We're only like an hour and a half from Asia. So, you know, the opportunity to put these, these big projects in the Kimberley as well and subsidise power in the region, but also to, um, you know, sell to Indonesia and then on sell into the Asian grid. I mean, it's, it seems to be a no brainer, but it's been really difficult to convince our government that this is the way we should be investing. So private corporations, private individuals are getting behind these big projects and are investing across the nation. So, you know, there's a, a lot of hope there. So, you know, we just need to look at how are corporates making the transition? How are they ethically investing in these new economies? Because they will make money. <laughs> You know what I mean? So uh, what we're saying is get on board. There's real opportunities for new economies. We don't need to keep doing dirty old business the old way. Right. Well, and, and but this, the, the downside to that is every time you think you've gained a little bit, in, especially in regard to uh, use of fossil fuels, et cetera. I mean, one thing I say often is that, you know, the one thing the men and women have always done really well ever since we could stand on two feet is burn stuff. You know, we know how to burn stuff. And we need to get away from that. And every time you make a little bit of gain, there's some, some it's like a leaking oil. It, it kind of oozes through the cracks. You know, even as we start to use less uh, oil and gas for powering vehicles, for example, with a move towards electric cars, then the big companies in China and the United States and the rest of the world uh, just start making, using the oil to make more plastic. So you, we, it's, hard, it's hard to gain on them. Uh, and talk to me about uh, Aboriginal science and what's being lost and what's, or maybe what's being ignored in, in this process. Is, is that an easy uh, and a question or vast? Well, it, it's interesting. I'll give you a fast answer, but basically, you know, the theme of our night tonight is living with nature. We've not moved away from nature. We've not severed our relationship with the Garden of Eden. We've stayed with it. We've nurtured it. We've loved it. We've cared for it. And so traditional knowledge or Indigenous science is really about, you know, you, you're talking to the oldest living culture in the world, the Indigenous people from Australia. We are the first scientists, the first engineers, the first architects, the first astronomers, you know, farming, all of these things. So the evidence is emanating out showing that, yes, you know, we were the first people to grind uh, flour and all of these sorts of things. So I think it's, you know, what I'm trying to bring to the conversation is that we're dealing with complexity and we need collective wisdom and that it's time to stop othering Indigenous people and bring us into working with the rest of the team in terms of how we're going to right-size the planet and achieve planetary health and well-being, you know. So 
I think one of the things is it's traditional ecological knowledge. When we are born, we are told and trained very, very early that we have a relationship with a non-human being, a totem, a judge teaches us how to be human, teaches us values and ethics, teaches us how to live with nature. So from that perspective, um, we, we, we're told, look up in the sky, down in the ground. So we are observational from a very early age. So, you know, it's something that we live with country, we live with nature, and um, we've learned to coexist and live with it in peace and harmony and using all of the techniques, you know, cool fire burning, best water regulators and managers in the world in terms of these diverse systems, whether they're in rivers or lakes or billabongs or in the desert. So it's an opportunity to just sit down and create a dialogue, I reckon, and say, start uh, to see this knowledge as being equal in terms of value and how do we start to bring it into unpacking the complexity that we need for right-sizing the planet? Yeah, there's a couple of um, amazing books that are out that you know talk about I mean, there's lots of books, but there's a couple that I read when I was working, when I first got back to Australia about six, seven years ago, The Greatest Estate on Earth and Dark Emu that talk about, you know, all the things that were going on in the indigenous cultures that have been archeologically confirmed that we don't learn about in school and we don't talk about in the Australian culture. And, you know, I highly recommend if people are interested to have a look at that. You know, Albert talks a little bit about this as well in, in our film and says, you know, that indigenous science is just like every other science. It's tested and, you know, through trial and error. And, you know, you, you, that's, that's how science was established in every culture and that it needs to be listened to. And that there are so many examples of, of this that, you know, I'll let Anne speak to. Mm. And, and, yeah, and, one of the things that sorry, one one of the things that's really unique at the moment is, you know, obviously I'm writing science and law, law papers and whatever, but the Matawara Fitzroy River has been recognised by prestige journals that it is a, an author. So on many of the papers that I publish, Matawara Fitzroy River is the first author. So we're bringing in this co-becoming, this understanding that the land is alive. It's an intellectual living system. It communicates with us. We reflect the knowledge and the wisdom it gives. So that's been something interesting in terms of going into science and legal journals is that the Matawara Fitzroy River is recognised by prestige journals that it is an author. So, you know, we're bringing in new knowledge, we're pushing it, the boundaries, we're being brave and putting information out there. But as, um, you know, Nick's saying is that, you know, this has been living thousands and thousands of years in a deep relationship with nature. So it's part of co-becoming, feeling the landscape, hearing country, seeing it and being a part of it and sharing that lived experience with other people who want to co-become in that way. And is there a specific Aboriginal or Indigenous science that is related to uh, the modern day dilemma of climate change? I mean, are there things that you that are recognized on the land there that could be being done or should be being done, but are being ignored because of this move towards exploitation versus uh, more, more natural ways of, of treating or healing the land? Well, there's probably so many. Yeah, no, look, sorry. Yeah, Nick, I just wanted to just when you said that, um, it just flicked in my mind because this is one of the things that we're not having documented. We are not showing the climate stress that we are currently living with, not right now. The river systems are drying up. The living water systems are drying up. Food insecurity, water scarcity, these are real things impacting on our lives right now. The temperature is heating very drastically. The water table is shifting south. These are things that we're living with and impacting on not just our lively livelihoods, but our life way. So we are, you know, at the first hand of seeing and experiencing this. So that's one of the things that's not being factored into the water planning is that you're coming to take water out when we're already living with water stress. So, you know, we read the country, we feel it, we hear it. And what we're saying is that we are seriously being impacted by climate change right now in terms of our um, our life ways. Yeah, I mean, there's there's mapping being done of the underground water tables and underground rivers by CSIRO, for example, that are now lining up with indigenous song lines and indigenous paths that have been created in the past. So, you know, we're seeing that the modern, our modern science is, is just uh, picking up exactly what people on the ground there already knew. You know, there's traditions like what Albert's involved in as a ranger of burning off in the, in the 
burning off so that bushfires can't take control. So you're burning off the, the, the fuel load that's on the ground ahead of time and creating um, areas where the fire can't jump across into new areas so that you know if fire, bushfires start and they start out there all the time in the dry season, they can't burn through like the things that are happening on the East Coast in Australia and we see in California because there's been traps built throughout the dry throughout the season where they burnt off the fuel so the fire can't just race through large tracks and that's happening that's what the rangers what albert and his crews are doing all year round things like that are happening to protect the land i mean that's just one example mm -hmm. and albert, yeah, you make you me think so, sorry you made me think there nick because you know as john was saying we're talking about shale gas so we're talking going five to seven sometimes possibly nine kilometres in terms of fracturing the bedrock. So with mm. the fugitive emissions, you know, methane and all of that, could you imagine how we're going to put out future fires on this landscape if we've got this sort of gas totally emitting, you know, with no control? Because we know, you know, from your history, John, of working in the fracking areas, that once we start to fracture the bedrock, there's no guarantee that these emissions are only going to come up one pipe we're fracturing the whole bedrock. And so therefore there's gonna be instability and we're gonna have all of these greenhouse gases, including methane, just burning fires forever. So, you know, we don't, we just seem to be rush, 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 you know, seriously, the things that we need to do, we need a minimum of five years data and we haven't even started to collect anything. We've, we're doing all our planning on, well, the government is doing all of their planning on historical data. There's no projection of climate science in the current mode of, of operations right now. And this is a real big issue because what we're saying is that we impacted on by climate change. And what you're going to do is just gonna create a huge um, drain on the current limited resources we currently have. That river behind you floods during the wet. And then after that, it turns into an ephemeral river receding into Billabong. So groundwater um, and living water systems are so dependent. We, we're saying that the system's fully allocated any take from the system is water extraction. So we just want to go, okay, how do we ground this in multiple forms of science? Most of all, the wisdom and the science of indigenous people who've managed the system from the beginning of time, how do we get that right? So yeah, it's, it's a bit scary when you were talking, I'm thinking, okay, at the moment we've got our rangers managing country, but once we start to frack 500,000 square kilometers of, of this basin system, how are we going to put out future fires with the fugitive emission that's going to escape? Yeah, the, 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 that, that f a future based on fracking is not a, not a future. And we, yeah. we witnessed here, here in the United States, while the, the smartest scientists, environmental scientists in the country were running around, this is you know, 10, 15 years ago, we're running around the country kind of explaining why fracking was so bad because of the chemicals involved in, in the process and the incredible waste of, of fresh water, et, et, et cetera. The government was was denying it, but at the same time, their own scientists were seeing the same things. But they yeah. but they denied, 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 denied. Um, well, that's the way the government works in Australia too. We just yeah. saw the announcement yeah. by Scott Morrison for COP twenty six, which is just a sort of white greenwash of, of the policies, trying to reposition them and not really t taking on the um, extractive industries. But going back to the science of one other small example, you know, is, is indigenous food and medicine, which is, you know, there's a whole industry, there's a small kind of cottage industry around gubbinge, which is one of the kakadu plum that grows in the region. Um, it's incredibly high in vitamin C, it's considered a superfood. And it's one of the things that, that could be expanded and create local businesses there. And, th and there's many, many examples of this. Um, so it's it's really about supporting people on the ground that that have that 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 want that want to create and their own business and looking into you know what all these great things that have been in the culture there are and how they can be brought to the rest of us like like this garbage plant it's already being used in in vitamins and other things but it's you know it's barely known in Australia I didn't know about it until I went up there. Mm -hmm. And Albert Wigan was going to join us today, but he unfortunately was not able to. He's in your film. I'm just, you, you, you both know him. I'm kind of curious if you can represent what it's like for him working as a ranger on the ground in the Kimberley in regard to the community understanding of, of the things that are kind of hard to define, like climate change. I mean, is there cognizance on the ground there in the, in, in the region that, 
that things are changing and, and here's why? Or does, does Albert and his team, do they have to do a lot of time just trying to explain or, or, or educate? I think they do a lot of explaining. I know, you know, a lot of those ranger groups, I'll let you speak to this more, Anne, are also involved in carbon trading and carbon assets. So, you know, there, there's a good understanding of what's going on on the ground there. I mean, they're also, when I was there, Albert was also doing a Bilby study that was a new road was being put through out onto the peninsula where he lives. And they had to, the rangers had taken responsibility and got government contracts to do a study of these tiny bilby creatures to make see how they were impacted by the road. I mean, they're doing a lot of environmental work as on their lands and, and the ranger program has expanded all over the north of Australia. So yeah, do you want to say more about that, Anne? Yeah, no, uh, I think part of this is also the diversity of the workforce in terms of how do we create these new economies. So one of the things that we've been doing is um, around walking trails in terms of, you know, this amazing river. How do we walk with people through country? How do we show people, you know, the amazing bird life we have here? Like the Kimberleys has almost 60% of the population of the birds of the whole of Australia that the um, majority of the world songbirds come from Australia. So it's an amazing place. It's an amazing culture. And one of the things is that there is an opportunity, as Nick was saying, in terms of bioprospecting, like on my land, we have one plant that has 30 times the property of morphine. It's also an antibiotic, particularly in terms of times of golden staff. It's an analgesic, it's an antiseptic, it's an antibiotic. And how do you do ethical trade? How do you get the benefit sharing right? How do you manage patents and copyright? So there's a level of complexity, but there's really seriously an opportunity to do different business a different way. I mean, one of the studies that we're doing is I understand that the bobobad trees in Africa are all imploding because the water table is also shifting south. So one of the things that we've been looking at is studying our boab population the, the species and the genus is slightly different but in terms of this is an amazing plant system that is you know a, a real resource the the flower um, is worth more per ounce than gold uh 1400 1500 an ounce per ounce for gold it also has high vitamin c it's all of these things so there's a way you know like what we're saying what we're trying to encourage people is you know, partner with Indigenous people, look at how do you incubate new economies and new businesses. Aboriginal people are asset rich, but um, we don't have the real capital to develop these sorts of industries. What does ethical and fair trade look like? How can we take people down this river system and introduce them to a world that very few Australians know about? So there is great opportunity to do business. There's obviously, it has to be, we have to understand the science to know what we're doing in terms of the product that we're wanting to market, but there is a whole lot of diversity. I mean, the global geoparks that Nelson Mandela set up, people, it's like bird watching. They will look for them all over the world. They're in Korea, they're in China, and we've got this amazing geographical and geological landscape. And we're saying, come and be a part of it. Come and, you know, let us take you along here. Let's walk through the country. Let's get to know this place. And um, there is really seriously a good way to look at what we call the culture conservation and science economies and how do we do that in an ethical way in a true partnership where we can come and be as equal to the table and build the new economies together nice. well, i think i think albert speaks in your film nick and, he, and, he, and i believe this is albert it says why should we have to prove to the government that this is our land um this is an ongoing issue obviously in australia and in many other parts of the world um how, how do you how do you deal with that? And I mean, that, that seems like one of those issues that should, should have been, uh, you know, concluded, yeah, no, it's, concluded it's, decades it's very... ago. <laughs> Complex, I, I, you know, I, I'm laughing, I'm laughing, but I should be crying because um, two weeks ago, I got told that um, where I live, I've been building an amazing wilderness center, huge cabins, big auditorium out there with the ecotourism, working with scientists, bringing them in. And uh, two weeks ago, I got told that, oh, we don't really care what you do as your economy. We're bringing a diamond mine right to your doorstep. And uh, you have no opportunity to say no because you have possibly the most racist uh, law in the land, which is native title, which does not protect my rights. So I'm now having to look at this from, hey, the wars come to end. Hey, what are these new opportunities? Why should I say 
yes to a diamond mine. Why should I um, allow the state government, who I believe does not have the right to give my rights to a third party? So property rights are really on the table for Indigenous people right now in this country in terms of it's no longer just about interest. It's about justice. It's about equity. It's where do we fit in terms of the ownership of this land before um, you know, people came. And so what we're saying is that let's do this differently. Let's look at what does it mean to be a sovereign person? How can we enter into negotiations where my life is not sacrificed for 30, 40 years of a diamond mine, which right now there are two case scenarios in the Kimberley that are just what I'm saying are environmental disasters. And you know what they say, if you do something a third time the same way, then you're a bloody idiot. So, you know, I'm at the coalface right now where I am looking to mount my own campaign in terms of saying the diamonds that I can show people in the sky are worth more than what you can dig up from the ground. And then the other day, someone came to me and said, oh, do you realize that um, someone's come up with a new idea, a great idea of how they can extract carbon from the air and make beautiful diamonds. So, you know, people are creative. There's different ways. We just need to give it a premium price and then people who can afford them will want them. But um, I don't think these sorts of industries should be trading off our lives and our life ways for the greater good of somebody for small, small gain in such a short time. And as I say, you know, um, I'm not going anywhere. So, Will we follow, follow this story because it's a live case and uh, the world's going to know about it. But yeah, it, we have to move beyond that. You know what I mean? So it's time to start to look at what does property rights for Indigenous people mean, particularly water rights. And then we need to encompass that within a land rights, especially when you're given a title that says you have exclusive possession against the world. And so when I hear that, that means against the state government, against the federal government, and against these mining companies. So that will soon be tested out in, in a reality and I'll uh, keep people you know, tuned into that, but um, it's just ridiculous. Mm. I sat in um, on several native title cases while I was working on the film and you know, native title is the land rights law in Australia for indigenous people. They, they're granted native title over their land, but it only gives them rights to camp, fish, hunt on the land. Uh, they, they, you know, they, the, often the native title tracts are overlapped by pastoral leases or mining leases or other things. Native title also only gives people a six month window to negotiate if, um, if, if a company wants to extract or set up some other business there, they have to negotiate with the people. But often those companies can circumvent that by stalling, by there's things going on all the time. You'll see some examples in the film of you know, companies coming into communities and making deals with certain people in the community and not having open discussion and including the whole community and splitting up families, splitting up communities by offering money to certain people to sign documents on the side when free and open discussion hasn't taken place. So there's real issues with native title and we have a very simple explainer on the Undermine Film website of what native title is. Um, it's complicated, but... Um, it's something that needs to be rectified and it's it's being abused. Um, I'm sure Anne would agree by, by corporate interests. Mm -hmm. Well, one, one question for you, Anne, is how is this impacting, you know, a lot of these issues are things that we of a certain age are, are, have been dealing with for a while and we'll deal with for a short while to go. How, how are these issues, especially environmental issues in the Kimberley impacting the youth, the young people in the area, are they, how is their physical health, how is their mental health? Yeah, look, I think one of the things as well is that we in the Kimberley, in terms of the impact of colonisation, we have the highest suicide rate in the world. So we need to be as leaders, lifting our young people up, offering them hope, creating partnerships where we can redefine new industries, new economies, and show that this human capital has immense value and that we need to be investing in our young people, not burying them. So, you know, from that perspective, what we're saying is that there is real opportunity to do things differently. Um, and also this puts the responsibility also back to Indigenous leaders as well in terms of how do we start to uh, dream new dreams in terms of we're no longer accepting the way that business has been done across many of our organisations. And what I'm saying is that it's time to hear the voices of these young leaders. They're in 25 to 40s and they're saying, when is it their turn? 
So my investment right now is how do we invest in them? How do we, you know, uh, get them connected? Because they're connected to world culture. They, how do, what, do they, what does innovation look like? What does entrepreneurship look like? How do we start to invest in a cost of a life saved? So these are issues that are, are there. And uh, I think there's, there, I believe that there is hope. Um, and that's the thing that drives and motivates me because I think once people come here and get to know what the potentiality is, I think there's seriously new ways to create these new economies and these new industries. And our young leaders need to be a very big part of that. Yeah. Yeah, I met a lot of uh, very inspiring young leaders while I was up there, including Albert and Sissy Gore and lots of other people who are really doing incredible things to support their communities. You know, there, there are real issues on the ground for, in some communities, in some towns, especially in Fitzroy Crossing, I guess, and other places. But, um, you know, the, the, there's great hope and resilience in the people there too. And, and, and that was one of the most inspiring aspects of spending time up there and getting to know people and making the film was just being inspired by the, the, the young and older leaders in the communities who are lifting people up and offering hope against quite a difficult backdrop a lot of the time. Yeah. You know, maybe on that note, maybe we should, do, should the, maybe we should show the trailer from Undermine and then... Oh come back and have a few more questions to, to uh, wind up. Um, we'll ask the powers that be if that's doable or not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm waiting for some collective giant nod of the head uh, from uh, the organizers, but uh, there we go. <laughs> Maybe mute and... Uh... I was born on Fossil Down Station, where my ancestors came from. I grew up very much one with the land. We've shared this land with everybody, with generous spirit, despite the atrocities that have happened. We've announced uh, more than $650 million in roads, water and other infrastructure in the north. And that rhetoric of jobs, jobs, jobs is an illusion. How are we as Australians letting our country be developed? To whose benefit, to whose interest? You know, really, we're being used. We either had to take the deal or suffer the consequences of losing any sort of capacity to control the development. Someone is going to mine that country. Surely we can get some local people trained up into that. It's a 47-year mine line. It's an intergenerational opportunity. Please, can you just speak to us like we actually have half a brain? Why do so many Kim Lee children feel that the only option they have is to take their own life? Aboriginal Australia doesn't want to go into your backyard, doesn't want to disturb you. It doesn't want to exploit your resources or your privacy or your, your inheritance. Aboriginal people don't want to do that to white Australia. Whereas every single day, Aboriginal people are facing that dilemma. Give it time and we wonder why. Do what we can, laugh and we cry. Great, thanks, John. Yeah, uh, <laughs> sorry. I, I guess, Nick, my, my question is, as a fellow filmmaker, my question for you is, is can, do, do movies, can media, can movies make a difference mm -hmm. in, an, in an issue like this? Well, yeah, I think they can. I think, firstly, they can inform people. I think, um, you know, one of the biggest reactions we got showing the film, uh, we premiered at the Melbourne Film Festival, you know, to a thousand people in the first screenings, the biggest cinema they have. And, um, you know, we had a very robust discussion there and at, at most of the East Coast screenings around what's happening in the Kimberley. People just don't know. It's not covered much in the media. Um, most of the media stories you get about remote communities are, are, are bad luck stories or about suicide or other social issues. And, and I think our film just showed the, the, again, the resilience and beauty and hope of the people whilst examining, you know, a couple of examples of the type of stories that are going on there all the time. And so I do believe that media and film um, can, can help people understand situations. And I think that's, a, that's definitely what long form documentaries try to do, or certainly the ones I make. 
probably you too, John, give people a, a window into the world and insight into what's happening and just allow them to make informed decisions and, and to change their opinions about certain places and, and what's going on up there. So I hope that I hope that that's what the film does. Yeah, no, I'm a big believer the media can make a difference. I have, I, have one, I have a couple of questions here from the audience, but Anne, I had one, one last question for you myself is, well, how do you find uh, optimism? Where do you, where do you, where, how do you stay hopeful given how much you, you know and, and you've seen and you understand? Hmm. I have faith in the human spirit. I, I really think that this is what has got to be ignited and I feel that movement globally and nationally. So that's what gives me hope. It also is the people who come to us. We call people to us is what the elders say. So hmm. this is a story, it's out there. It is, has a global relationship. Um, we are protecting something that belongs to the world, not just to our nation. So we hope, as uh, Nick was saying in your work, uh, you know, film is such a powerful way of telling the story. And for me, it was the stories from the filmmakers and the photographs and the, all of those sorts of um, things that brought the people with us. Because in a way, we're testosterone out on science. We need a different way to communicate. And the power of the story through media is a way of bringing people to country and taking country to people. So from that way, film is such a powerful thing. And, you know, hopefully we'll get a chance to see the little story that we're moving towards in terms of showing this diversity in this region from Indigenous people that we still hold our law, we still practice our customs, we still care about this river system as a living ancestral being with a right not only to live and but a right to flow as well. So, you know, film is so powerful. As I said, it was the artists that brought the people from the world to us and it's the filmmakers and the storytellers that take it back out so it's such a powerful medium because it gets the hearts the hooks and hopefully the minds and hopefully investment to come and stand with us to be strong and to have hope mm, well Here, here's a, yeah that was lovely thank you uh, here's a question from from ellen or from l i'm sorry and even as i say that now it just disappeared uh, I had a question from Al, but it'll, it'll come back here. Uh, how, how do people see the movie, uh, Nick? Uh, if you go to the website, undermindfilm.com, you can, you, can, you can click through and, and organize to watch the film there. There's also screenings going on uh, in the UK and Europe for free through uh, the Menzies Institute and Origins Film Festival. If you Google either of those, you can watch the film for free online. Now, just by registering, I think it's up for another week on that platform. Um, and, and again, the, the website will keep you up to date. Okay. Here, here's the question from Alan. It's for Anne. How can we, as the average Joe blog, support Aboriginal and Indigenous business directly? What are some of the ways we can make better choices and also apply pressure where it's most impactful? Yeah, one of the things say is that we have no expectation of people, but what I would like to do is encourage people to come to the Mudawar Fitzroy River website that's been put into the chat line because we are also supporting some of the young entrepreneurial developers as well, people who are looking to become storytellers, artists, scientists. So, you know, there's a whole array and then we can divert people out because we're like a, the brokerage model for what's happening on country so we can filter things out. So I'd say get on board, subscribe to the Mudawar Fitzroy River Council, get to know the diversity of different communities out there doing great things and uh, yeah, needing a hand up, not a handout. Mm -hmm. And what, what do you, Anne, what do you think about the big conferences like this upcoming or perhaps ongoing COP26? Are those big uh, events like that where 10,000 people gather in one place, are those helpful or are they or, or not? You know, if it could just change one mind in our nation, uh, just from that encounter, I think it'd be well worthwhile. But because we're dealing with complexity, we need to have a systems thinking approach to the diverse ways that we need to interact at a legal political level, at a policy level, at a league, you know, on the ground changing laws. So I think it's multiple strategies. I come from the perspective we need collective wisdom. And if this is a frame that can bring justice and equity for nature and for Indigenous people, and we can turn climate ch change into a climate chance, then I'm saying go for it. So I believe in hope. I think we need to dream big and we need to be have multiple strategies of how we're going to stand together 
indigenous and not and right size the planet because we don't have the time that I think we think we have. Great. Can I just add about COP? I'm actually going up there next week um, to Glasgow. We're working with a group, a new group that we've set up called the Kelvin Circle, supporting uh, indigenous activists and people that are coming to COP. They're staying in the Kelvin Castle right outside Glasgow, about 70 people that we're hosting there. And, you know, I think the, those are the voices we're trying to support and amplify. Um, unfortunately, due to the lockdowns and restrictions of travel from Australia, there aren't any Australian representatives, but there's people coming from Mexico, from Africa, uh, from South America, from the Amazon, and that'll be in this group. And, you know, if you look out for Kelvin Circle, we'll be putting that out from the moment the COP starts. There's also COP26 TV that we're involved with. And, you know, the, of course, the main focus of COP is, is are these big meetings in the blue zone, but in the green zone, there's gonna be a lot of other voices that are hopefully gonna be heard and put pressure on those decision makers. Here's a question from Jerome. Either of you can probably answer this. Uh, the super rich, like Jeff Bezos, et cetera, have just pledged US $5 billion for supporting conservation areas that include indigenous people. Given the context of resource extraction being so privileged by governments the denial of land rights and recognition, how can this huge pot be put to best use for genuinely supporting indigenous land caring as part of the 30 by 30 land protection initiative? Will it work? Hmm. That's a huge question. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I guess, will it work and who decides where those monies are spent? That's, that's a, well, that's another, the question, how is the money spent? I guess, you know, the way Anne was speaking, there's so many ways the money could be spent as long as it is spent in a diverse way and that Indigenous people have a say in how that's spent. I think that would be my opinion on it. I was allowing Anne to weigh in, but I think she's... she's yeah, no, and it's a, it's a very important question because it's a question I have, like the government at the moment and the multinationals are investing in a $1 billion gas pipeline. And I put a challenge out to the, to the world and to the nation that what could you do with $1 billion if you invested it in the culture, conservation and science industries that could be co-led by Indigenous people because mm. we definitely want people to get a good return. So what is the alternative... A model, the turn to model is to fund those co designed and indigenous led projects that are on the ground. One billion dollars. I mean, for 150 years of uh, compensation of colonialism, I'm sure I could spend that money quite wisely. <laughs> well, as, we, as we've been having this conversation, I had an email from, uh, uh, it's not from the UK government, but it's, a, it's, a, it's detailing the UK government having a holding a special event at COP26 uh, to address uh, the, the rights of nature and ind indigenous, indigenous peoples. They're having a press conference on uh, tomorrow, or no, today, October 27th. It's ongoing, so, uh, you, you know, it, it, it's, it's, in the, it's in the realm, people are talking about it, but, uh, you know, the, as well as the, the fact that man has always burned stuff to, to make advancement. We're also very, very slow to learn and very slow to change. Um, fingers crossed because we don't have a lot of, a lot of extra time. Um, but I, I'm encouraged, Dan, by your, your kind of optimism and your hope. Uh, one, one, one thing I wanted to ask you is in, as we were introducing ourselves today, you, you used the phrase, wake the snake. I wasn't sure if that was related to the, to the Fitzroy or uh, some, other, some other issue. Yeah, no, it's a very important uh, cultural concept, wake up the snake. And if people Google it, I've been talking about this globally for the last two, three years, but wake up the snake means how do we wake up the consciousness of the people to bring the people with us? So that's what wake up the snake means. And that's what we're doing. We're doing it with Nick's work and hopefully, John, with your work and what you're doing in the gas area as well. But we need to wake up the consciousness of the people because the movement needs to be led by the people because we can no longer rely on our nation states. No. Good, and we were gonna show, Nick brought another trailer for a short, for, for another film, Serp The Serpent's Tale. Yes, not my film, Anne's more involved in this. Uh, I, and it's the perfect way to lead out having that last statement from Anne. Yeah, maybe, maybe uh, 
Ed, Lydia, Katie, maybe we just hit play on that trailer and that'll be our swan song. But thank you to Anne very much. Lovely to meet over the over the Zoom here. And uh, Nick, same thing. Look forward to, to catching up on all your films and good luck uh, in Glasgow, et cetera. Thank you, John. Yeah. So I think maybe we'll unmute and let them uh, play the, the trailer. Thank you. Thank you very much. The ancient story of the serpent, the tree, and the spring goes back to the very beginning. It is where we all started. This is a story about water. And thus, life. travel high up into the sky and down through the rain. I am the seven colors that radiate. I am the river. I am the sea. I am adorned on the rocks and I am laid on the ground. I am respected by all save one. And yet my people still sing me, and I to them. The nations of Aboriginal people still hold tightly to our law, to our land, to our sea and to our sky. I sing this to you, singing the River Law song, the Wollongari, for people and for country. <laughs> <laughs> 